Praise God. Come on, church. Praise him in this house. Come on. Come on. He's worthy. You just sang. You just sang. Worthy is the lamb. Come on. Oh, for a thousand th tongues to sing. Praise us to our king. Come on. If you have breath in your lungs, let everything that has breath praise the Lord this morning. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Hallelujah. We give you the glory, Lord, this morning. Praise God. God is good. I thank God for uh, allowing us to be um, in his house uh, to worship him in truth and spirit uh, by the blood of the lamb. And um, thank him for the chance he gives us to look together into the word of God. Uh, I want to take just a moment to also uh, acknowledge and thank God for the man of God who he has placed over this house. Uh, even though he's not here with us today, we thank God for him and for teaching us week in and week out, what, almost maybe seven days a week, teaching us the word of God. I thank God for him. Thank God for the woman of God with him. They serve us week in and week out. Also want to thank uh, God for the man of God who is here teaching us today and our fellow ministers of God. I want to thank God for the youth elders also who teach us uh, week in and week out from the word of God, serving faithfully. Um, I can honestly say I stand on all of their shoulders, so I thank God for them. Can we just pray real quick? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for giving us this chance to come into your house. Um, thank you for your goodness. It's because of your unfailing love that we are not consumed, God. For your compassions, they never fail. Your mercies are new every morning. How great is your faithfulness toward us. Father, thank you for this chance to look into your word together. Father, we believe your word is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Your word is able to pierce into each of our hearts, O oh God, uh, even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. We believe, Father, you discern our hearts and our intents with your word, O oh God. And we believe, Father, there is nothing we can hide from you, Lord. And we believe, God, as we sit before your word, that your word will examine us and everything is naked and open before your eyes, O oh God. And Father, we need you to speak, O oh God. We need you to speak. We pray right now, God, whoever is listening here, whoever is listening online, Father, let the poor hear good news this morning, God. Let the captive, oh God, be set free. Let the blind receive their sight, oh God. Let the oppressed be set free in Jesus' name, oh God. And let them hear the favor of the Lord today, oh God. Holy Spirit, help us this morning to glorify Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you can turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. We're going to kind of be um, hanging in between those two uh, chapters this morning. I'm uh, going to read first in chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now first, uh, I'm going to read from verses 4 to 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4 to 11. But you are not in darkness, brothers, and I'm reading from the ESV version. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day, which is the day of the Lord, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, meaning whether we are physically alive or have left from this earth, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. I'm going to skip a few verses, go down to 5, verse 23 
and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who call, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. If you can go back a chapter, chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand, and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And if we can skip and read verses 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. I wanted to talk a little bit today about sanctification. Sanctification. Sanctification uh, and, and, and God's uh, initiative in sanctification, the steps he takes, and then our response. The definition of sanctification, you know, when we hear that word, sometimes a lot of times we've heard it growing up in the church. We hear it a lot. Sometimes it's considered Christianese. But simply put, sanctification means consecration uh, or to set apart or to be set apart. Also means purification of heart and life. Purification of heart. When the Bible talks about sanctification, it's talking about your heart and your life. You know, a lot of times I know in today's society, we just like to say, you know, I can live any which way. God looks at my heart. God sees my heart. Yeah, on the one hand, that's true. But the way you and I live our life matters. It matters to God. Okay. So from the passages that we read uh, to kind of simply go through it. You know, what is God telling us about sanctification? What is it? Okay, if we look at verses 1, 3, and 7 of chapter 4, it's a clear call to live set apart. Okay, you know, to be holy, to be sanctified. Simply put, in today's, you know, world, we can say to live set apart. And it's not a man-made thing. It's not a man-made message. This is the God who made you and me, the God who sent his one and only son to die for your and my salvation. This is his word. This is not a suggestion. It's not if you feel like, do it. This is a clear call, and there should not be any doubt about it. There is no gray area. I know today, especially in the last 10, 20 years, especially in the last 10 years, there's, you know, you, you live your truth, and I live my truth there's a lot of that going on, but this is not what God's word says. It's a clear, black and white, there's no gray area here. He wants you and me, if he paid the big price of sending his one and only son, and his one and only son paid the big price of his entire life, I don't think this is much for God to ask of you and me. Okay, we'll go back to verses 1, 3, and 7 in chapter 4 again. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more, more and more. He's trying to encourage the believers because he understands living this life in this world, it can be hard. 
to live set apart for the Lord. In, in cancel culture, in you know, living amidst with our peers, it can be hard. It does get hard. That's the truth, right? But he's saying keep doing so more and more. He's saying keep going, okay? And he's trying to encourage us. Verse 3, uh, I'll come back to verse 3 later. Verse 7, clear enough. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Okay, plain and simple. I think the KJV says, God has not called us unto impurity, but unto holiness. Okay, I want to touch on verse 3 a little bit. Uh, it says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, to be set apart, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That term sexual immorality there, it's not just talking about sexual sins. It's not just talking about fornication or adultery. One of the other meanings is idolatry. Idolatry, right? Obviously not bowing down to an image or a statue, right? Do you and I struggle with idolatry today in our lives? What is idolatry? Allowing anything to take the place of God in our hearts and lives. Anything, anything or anyone, spouse, children, your best friend, money. What is it for you? What is it for me? As we sit before God's word, can we ask him, Lord, I may not be engaging in sexual immorality or adultery or fornication, but do you see any idolatry in me? Okay. And uh, just to keep moving forward, uh, actually I wanted to touch on a verse. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 also talks about walking in a manner worthy. Chapter 2 verse 10. You are witnesses and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers, I think I might be reading the wrong verse. Um, it says to walk in the manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Why is this important? Why does he want you and me to live set apart and sanctified? Okay, because he paid the price. First Thessalonians 1 verse 10. It says, we are to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay? Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And we don't have time to go too deeply on this. What is the wrath to come? It's talking about God's day of judgment against mankind's sins. First Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, we don't have time to read into it too much, but chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, and throughout the book of Thessalonians, and throughout the epistles, the apostles talk about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is coming. Are you ready for the day of the Lord? Prepare yourself for the day of the Lord. It's not talking about when Jesus raptures the church. That's what you and I are waiting for, right? That's a different day. But he keeps talking about the day of the Lord when his wrath on unbelieving mankind, on sinful mankind, who did not take the chance of salvation through his son, when he unleashes that wrath, right? That is why he sent his son in the first place, to save us from that wrath. And he's saying, if you and I put our trust in his son to save us from that wrath, how can we live moving forward as if that never happened in the first place? How can we live moving forward, going back to the sin that he tried to save us from? So he's encouraging us saying, you know, he sent his son to deliver you from the wrath to come. Deliver you from the, from the day of God's judgment against mankind's sins. And then 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9. He says, for God has not destined us for wrath. He didn't make you and me for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. He gave his son to save you and me from that day of wrath. And so it is important how you and I live because the book of Revelation is clear. I don't have time to get into the, to the reference, but the book of Revelation, he's talking to the churches, not unbelievers. He's talking to the churches and saying, 
you know, whoever keeps living in a life of murder and sexual immorality and idolatry and magic arts. And he gives a big old list and he says that person will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking to the churches there. So it matters how you and I live. It matters because of the price he paid. And another reason, he says, why? Because his Holy Spirit dwells in us. Chapter 4, verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards this command to live set apart, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. It's as if God is saying, I gave my son, and I've given you my Holy Spirit to live in you. He's the Holy Spirit, right? What does that remind us of? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. What, how does it go? Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? We cannot live just any which way if this Holy Spirit, if you and I are serious about having an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, we cannot just live it any which way. And another reason, chapter 4, verse 17, another reason to live set apart. He's coming for a pure bride. He's coming for a pure bride. In Ephesians, he says he washes us with his word, and he's coming for a pure bride without spot or wrinkle. Right? Imagine a wedding day. If a bride walked in, her clothes all tattered and torn, and if she's lived a life of adultery and fornication, and if she walks into her groom, what kind of a sight would that be? What kind of a wedding would that be? What kind of a marital relationship would that be? Even more importantly, he's saying, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for a pure bride. So it matters how we live. In chapter 5, verse 4 to 8, it's because you and I are children of light. If you have given your life to Jesus, he calls us children of light. He talks about this in 1 John 2. Live in the light. Walk in the light. He's saying, I saved you out of the light. Let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 to 8. Um, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You are all children of light. Children of the day, not of the night or of the darkness. So don't sleep. Wake up is what he's saying. He's saying live sober. He's saying live sober, live awake. It's not just, you know, referring to alcohol, right? He's saying live spiritually awake. How can you and I live spiritually awake? Let's go to the next portion, right? What is going to help you and me to live spiritually awake? His word. Right? Chapter 4, verse 2, he says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Right? This is the importance of you and I looking into his word every day. Right? The book of James, he says, Look intently into the word of God. Don't just glance at it. Right? Take time to look at it and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Right? Look intently every day so that you and I can see, God, is there any sin in me? Is there any... Uh, idolatry in me is there anything in me that that keeps me from being that being that pure and holy bride for you so he, through his word through his spirit as we just read in four verse eight he gives us his holy spirit uh, who dwells in us the comforter the counselor our helper our advocate who walks with us the spirit of truth who guides us into all truth and then four verse 18 through the help of the church community over and over in the book of Thessalonians and elsewhere in the apostles, the apostles write, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words, right? Often that's one of the tricks of the enemy. He wants to make, when you and I are struggling with a certain sin, he wants to make it seem like, oh, you're the only one struggling with this sin. You're the only one so fallen down. But that is not true. That is a lie from hell. There are brothers and sisters here who are walking through this Christian journey with us, right? And so he says, meet together, encourage one another. Right? And just the last point I just wanted to make is that in this walk of sanctification, that one of the things that the enemy tries to do is to cause us to take our focus off 
of the sanctifier, of the one who started this process in the first place, right? What were you and I doing in the beginning of our Christian walk, before we became Christians, right? We were dead in our sin. We were dead in our sin. We didn't even know we were sinners until one day, maybe growing up in the church or maybe if you were outside of the church, you heard someone say the word of God and the word of God convicted us by the Holy Spirit and he gave us the realization, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I need to be set free from the darkness, right? So who started the process in the first place? He did. Throughout the Bible, we look, he's the one that reaches out right? And he's the one that starts the salvation process, right? But somewhere along the way, over the years of walking with the Lord, the enemy tries to come in and say, you know, okay, start leaning on your works, on your efforts, right? And, and, he, and he gets us into that. But what does he say? Trust in, in, in God. Philippians 2 verse 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You do have a part, but he says it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's a partnership, right? The enemy tries to get us to just lean on our own effort, but he's saying, no, you cannot do anything. You cannot live a set apart life unless God in you is empowering you by his spirit. So he's saying to trust in God, right? Uh, you know, so there's the, there's the dangers of, you know, if we focus too much on ourselves. One of the things it can lead to is a self-worship, a self-idolatry. We might be thinking, oh, I'm living a holy, set-apart life. But that's pride. That's sin. That's idolatry. You're worshiping yourself. I'm worshiping myself. If I'm living every day thinking, oh, I did a good job today. Right? That's wrong. And then the other side of it is, if, if we're too focused on our effort, then every time we fail, we get discouraged. That's the other side of things. So what's the answer? To bring our focus back to the one who started it all in the first place, the sanctifier. I love 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. You know, growing up, I, whenever I heard this verse, I, I almost never heard verse 23 being talked about. Whenever I heard verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. It was always in relation to some promise God made to bless you materially, you know, take you to the land of you know, milk and honey. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. That's how I always, I never knew about verse 23. And, and not to say, you know, God is a promise maker and he's a promise keeper. Whatever promises he's made in our life, he's faithful. He will do it. But in this instance, he's not talking about taking you and me to the land of milk and honey. He's not talking about God is faithful to give you and me a comfortable life with all our financial needs met and all of our relational needs met and all of our children's future being met. He's talking about God is faithful and dedicated to your and my sanctification. In Romans chapter 8, we don't have time to go there, but verse 20, 28, 29, you know, we talk about verse 28, and God will make all things work together for, you know, for the good of those who love him. We get so excited about that. The next verse says... He has predestined you and me, not for a comfortable life, not for all of our prayers to be answered. He predestined you and me to conform to the image of his son. That is our number one calling. You know, young people, if you're sitting out there and you're like, I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. I don't know his purpose for my life. I don't know what, what direction to go. Well, start there. Why can't we start there? His number one calling for you and me, young and old alike, no matter how we, long we've been walking with the Lord, his number one calling is to become more like his son. So when it says in verse 23 of chapter 5 of Thessalonians, verse 24, that he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. That means he is faithful and dedicated to walk alongside with you and me, to look more and more like his son every day. That means 
He's faithful and dedicated enough to your sanctification, to my sanctification, that he may allow moments, days, seasons, weeks, years in our life where we walk through something hard to allow his true character to come, in, come out in us. You know, I might be standing here thinking about the fruit of the spirit. I might think, oh man, I'm so full of love. I, was, I do a really good job at loving. And then that's when God's like, no, you don't. And he might put me in a situation to help me see, no, Nisi, you're lacking in love. You're lacking in joy. You're lacking in peace. So when he says that he is faithful, that means he's dedicated enough to allow you and me through, to go through situations sometimes where we're like, why am I going through this? That's because he is working on you and me through whatever different situation to change us more and more into his image. And I just want to say, you know, here to closing, for those of us who have been walking with the Lord for some time, those of us who have received him as our Savior and Lord, you know, how yielded are we to his sanctification process in our life? How yielded are we? How active are we? You know, when Philippians talks about God is the one who does it and he's the one who sanctifies, that doesn't mean that you and I fold our hands and just let him do all the work. That means every time we go through trying seasons, we ask, Father, why, what is it, Lord? What are you working on? What are you trying to tell me? What are you saying to me? Right? And if anybody's here that hasn't received Jesus as their personal Savior, if anyone is listening, you know, will you give your heart to the Lord, to the one who gave his son to call you out of darkness into his light, to save you from the day of wrath against mankind's sin? Will you open up your heart and life to him? Thank you. God bless you.